Thank you for being here tonight. This is the fifth talk in our series, Music, Community Engagement and Social Action. Um, I just want to remind people that for the next two weeks, we'll have two more guests who are really exciting. I'll put the links to that, to the series in the chat, as well as a link to the um, playlist that where we're archiving previous talks. Um, so tonight our guest is Dr. Nicole Wright from Opus 118. Um, but uh, it, it, we have this really cool connection that our current second year master's violin performance student, Rose Baker, did an internship at Opus 118 when she was an undergraduate at Manhattan School of Music. And so I've asked her to host this talk and introduce Nicole. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rose now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, in just a moment, Dr. Wright is gonna speak much more holistically than me about the Opus 118 Harlem School of Music. And I'm gonna leave it to her to give you an overview of how the program works and what its goals are. But I'm just gonna briefly tell you about my own personal experience with Opus 118. So in my senior year of college, I spent a year interning with this organization in their violin teacher training program, which meant I got to observe and assist experienced teachers like Dr. Wright as they led group violin classes in some of New York City's elementary schools. I often got to observe the entire school day's worth of violin classes, which meant I could see teachers working with everyone from the six-year-old beginners all the way up to the fifth graders. Years before I interned at or even heard of Opus 118, I realized that I loved to teach violin, but I had already decided to pursue degrees in performance rather than in music education. I continu continued to feel that the right decision for me personally, at least for the time being, was to focus narrowly on my performance studies, but this left me with the serious dilemma of how could I become a stronger teacher who could actually give students the quality of instruction they deserve while also continuing on the degree track I had chosen. And this internship really helped me answer that question. One of the most crucial things I learned at Opus 18, 118 was the method for starting a beginning violin student. I learned about introducing a beginning, beginner to the myriad of very subtle details involved in holding the violin and bow correctly. When you can effectively teach a beginner these skills, you can set them up for success in the years of study to come. Through Opus 118, I was incredibly lucky to get to go into classrooms three days a week and practice helping students with their posture and bow hands while an experienced teacher supervised, helped, and gave feedback. I only spent a year with Opus 118 because I decided to come here to UMass. So obviously I still have a lot to learn about being a teacher, but this internship equipped me with so many teaching strategies that I continue to rely heavily on today. One other thing I knew nothing about prior to this internship was how to lead a classroom full of young kids with violins in hand. Dr. Wright is particularly a good role model in that regard because she knows how to give students individual attention, whether the attention they need is musical or what they need is for their teacher to listen to them and emotionally nurture them and be there for them. And even while she pays that individual attention, she still knows how to keep the rest of the class engaged and learning and happy. Towards the end of the internship, she even gave me multiple opportunities to practice leading classes on my own, during which she let me have the freedom to try out some of my own ideas. I quickly learned which of those ideas did and didn't work. The experience in particular helped me to develop confidence that I'm extremely grateful to be able to rely on now, and also gave me the joyful experience of getting to help kids learn how to play music. I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Wright and then turn the program over to her. In addition to her vital work as a teacher at the Opus 118 Harlem School of Music, Dr. Nicole Wright is an active performer on both violin and viola. She performs on viola with the Harlem Chamber Players and the Symphony and C Orchestra. She's toured internationally and has also performed on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, The Tonight Show, The David Letterman Show, and at the MTV Music Video Awards. She holds degrees both in music performance and education, including a DMA from Rutgers University. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Wright. Thank you so much for inviting Opus to be a part of the Social Action web series. I'm so grateful to be here. Again, my name is Nicole Wright and I'm the teaching master at Opus 118 Harlem School of Music. In today's presentation, I would like to share with you our story. It will include how Opus began, what we do and the position I hold within the organization. 
I will begin with how our program began. In 1981, Roberta Gaspari began teaching at Central Park East, a public school in East Harlem. That year, she held the first ever end of the year concert for our program. The concert wasn't very big and it wasn't very fancy. The program was handwritten and decorated by Roberta herself. The concert was a great success. Word began to spread about Robert, Roberta's amazing music program and the program began to grow to CBE's two affiliated schools. These schools are known as CBE2 and River East. The program grew from 40 students to 130 students and every year there was an end of the year performance which brought parents and grandparents to their feet, cheering and clapping and crying. Till this day, we have an end of the year performance that attracts over 400, over 400 audience members. Can you imagine all of these students on stage playing for over 400 people? It's, it's a magical experience. And it's an open opus tradition. Our end of the year performance includes all of the students affiliated with our program. The students would perform these songs they spent all year working on. During that time, there were about 130 students. Today, we have grown to 250 students. Now imagine 250 students that go to all different schools playing the same songs at once on stage. It truly, truly, truly is an experience that is unreal for not only the students, not only the teachers, but the families as well. Then, in 1991, there were budget cuts and the violin program was axed. What are we gonna do? What, do you, what should we do? Should we just give up? Many people would have given up, but Roberta Gaspari, she's a tough cookie. She did not give up. However, that didn't stop her. Working together with teachers and parents and volunteers, that's how Opus came to be, Opus 118, and that's how I came into the program. Violinist, Arnold Steinhardt, impressed by Roberta's music classes, engaged colleagues, Itzhak Perlman, Isaac Stern to organize Fiddle Fest, a benefit concert featuring the students performing at Carnegie Hall to keep the violin program alive. Arnold's wife, Dorothea, which was a huge, huge, huge part of why Opus came to be, worked tirelessly to help save our program. And all of their hard work worked. The first benefit concert funded Opus's funded Opus for the first three years of its program. That benefit, the Fiddle Fest, funded three years of Opus. And not only did it shine light on Opus 118, it became the series to us, it became the first of a series of many Fiddle Fests with acclaimed musicians such as Joshua Bell, Yo-Yo Ma, Bobby McFerrin, and Mark O'Connor. These musicians would perform alongside the students in their performance. Her passion to keep music alive in the Harlem Public Schools inspired two films, Small Wonders, which came out in 1996, and Music of the Heart, featuring Meryl Streep and Angela Bassett. Here's the trailer of Music of the Heart. I don't hear sound, Rose. Do what you're doing, man. You trying to kill me? Welcome to East Hall. I think I know these students. Their attention span doesn't go past Del Rey me. You know, maybe on a good day I can get them to fa. I think you're underestimating them. Any child can learn to play the violin. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. You stunk. Hey, no guns. Who's talking? Listen to me. No, don't. Listen to that. Who wants to be kicked out of my class? Why? They're violence for wimps. You didn't give me a good enough reason, so you're staying. I'm proud of you. Out of 50 kids, maybe six are listening to me at all. Faith Monday, didn't you say no one was listening to you? Yeah. So, look at the progress. 
you are a little too harsh. Stop, stop, stop! That sounds terrible! But I'm sure you might be able to soften your comments. Well, that was not so bad. Roberta? Why are you acting like that? Well, don't you want a nice teacher? I already got nice teachers. You added some variety. Isabel Vasquez, second grade. Why are you being so nice to me? I want my daughter in your class next year. What's the matter? Because it got fired. They don't want these again anymore. They slashed the budget. I see. After 10 years, after 1,400 kids have been have learned the violin. You think I haven't noticed what you've done for these kids? She gave them a gift they could never imagine. They gave the system a fight it would never forget. Some think that music isn't important for our kids. But they are wrong, and they're going to get a big fight. I would like you all to play from your heart. Play like I know you can play. Just play from here. Both films received Academy Award nominations. Some people do believe music isn't important for our students. But they are wrong and Opus is here to give them a big fight. Roberta believed everyone deserved a chance to have music, no matter their financial background. She would not let them stop. She would not let that stop them. I speak so passionately about this program because, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this program because I'm a product of music of the heart. I was in the program when it first began. Roberta introduced me to the violin. And the video is correct. She was a strict teacher. Guys. She was a strict teacher. She told us when we were bad. She told us when we needed to practice. She somehow magically knew when we didn't practice. I don't know how that happened, but she knew when we didn't practice. She wanted the best from us. And as a result, we were able to excel in music. Here's a clip from our end of the year concert at Carnegie Hall reenacted for the movie. Roberta's students were in the movie. This includes myself as well. You'll see me in the black and gold dress. It's really foofy, really fluffy. I don't know what my mom was thinking, but you know, she dressed me at that time. And that's what she put me in. It's the biggest black dress there. <laughs>
Because I was introduced to the violin by Roberta, I was able to find my passion in life, music. Roberta began my journey with the violin. And because of her, I was able to move on from Opus 118 and earn my bachelor's degree in music education and performance from Ithaca College, earn my master's degree in performance at Manus College of Music, as well as earn my doctoral of musical arts degree from Rutgers University. As you can see from what Harlem used to look like in the movie Music of the Heart, who knows what my life would have been like if I had not gone to CP2 and studied the violin program or studied in the violin program with Roberta Gaspari. Opus 118's philosophy is that every child deserves access to quality music education. We believe music inspires children. It makes them stronger because it fosters expression. It fosters self-confidence, creativity, and engagement. We will not let the cost of music deprive a student from receiving the opportunity to learn through music. So our mission has been dedicated to making quality music education affordable and available to the students of East Harlem. There are three unique aspects about our program. They are the in-school program, our after-school program, and our intern program. Our in-school program before COVID contained, like I said before, 250 students. In this Sorry, I just did that because the YouTube live stream was stopped for policy violations. I think it's because we played the clip. <laughs> so. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll start again. We're about our, let's start again with our in school program. So, our in school program contains 250 students. In this program, we send teachers into the public school of East Harlem to teach the violin twice a week. We see individual grades beginning in first grade and ending in eighth grade, depending on the school. What I love about this program is that it is completely free. The instructions are free. The violins are free. Every single thing about the in-school program is free for the enrolled students. We currently work with five different schools. The violin program within each school puts on a concert or several performances throughout the year. And at the end of the year, all the school comes together for a big end of the year performance, which I spoke about earlier. And we saw with the Fiddle Fest at Carnegie Hall. The last performance I did with my students at PS30 before COVID hit was for their Black History Month celebration. Here's a clip from our Black History Month performance. The images that you see within the picture were posted all around the school to help the students learn about their history and about African-American history. Rose, you may play when you're ready. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King. <laughs> Next, we will move on to our intern program. Our intern program is a teaching training program. What I love about this program is that we teach our interns how to teach the violin from beginner level to advanced levels. Our interns go into the classroom to observe our master teachers and are able to get hands-on experience with students in the classroom. They are also able to get one-on-one -on -one attention to help develop their own teaching skills. Another great bonus about this program is that our interns are paid for their time. In this program, we're able to train many established musicians who have earned their doctorates, masters, and undergraduate degrees from schools such as Juilliard, Manus, Fredonia, Manhattan School of Music, a variety of schools. But not only do they play well, but they also wanted to enhance their teaching skills. And they know that 
performing and playing go hand in hand. So they wanted to do this and they wanted to really emphasize and really improve their teaching skills. And Opus was happy to do that while paying them for their time. In fact, this is where I was able to develop my teaching skills. While I was in my doctorate program, I returned to Opus to become an intern. I knew when I was a child, not only did I want to perform, but I also wanted to teach. My mom said, if we go back to stories of when I was younger, my mother told me when I was around the age of four, five, six, I used to walk around with a book bag and think I was a teacher and try to teach anyone that would listen. After a while, my brother and sister would like not listen to me anymore. They would just ignore what I was doing. So what does a little girl do? Turn to the mirror. So I turned to the mirror and I would bring all my little stuffed animals, place it in the front of the mirror and act like they were my students and teach them everything I know. So I was around the age of like five, six, four. I'm not quite sure, but I was very, very young and I didn't know much, but that made me happy. So my mother just didn't mind. So fast forwarding many years, when I heard that this position was open at Opus, I knew that this was a place for me. I began as an intern learning everything I could. The master teacher I trained with loved the connection I had with the students at PS30, one of the schools we work with. So she set up a meeting with our director and myself and offered me a position to take her position as head teacher at that school. Then as I continued teaching and leading the program at PS30, other teachers also recognized the work that I did with the students. And as a result, they offered me the master teacher position. Currently at Opus, I am the head teacher at two different schools and I now train aspiring teachers. I also hold interviews for incoming new students. Working here is one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. I truly enjoy giving back to the community and the establishment that has helped me become who I am today. The students enrolled in our program come from many different backgrounds. I've had students in foster care. I've had students in shelters. So when they come to play music with the in-school program, it's a place that makes them feel safe. At PS30, they would run to class. They would try to stay with me all day. Some teachers even let them stay for more than one class period because they saw how much joy it brought the kids. They even would come during their gym period and their lunch period. And you know, if they come during their gym and their lunch period, they like you because that's the only free time they have in elementary school. Being able to work with these students and seeing their progress is the best reward I could have ever asked for. Here's a video from our holiday performance, which is perfect because the holiday is coming up. So here's a performance from our last holiday performance with PS30 students. None of these students take private lessons and they're all between the ages of six and nine. Well, you know, they might've turned like 10 within like the last couple of months, but they're between the ages of six and nine and do not take private lessons. In the other video, they didn't take private lessons either. No sound. Sorry, there's sound. <laughs> Mr. Cole, I am Oh my gosh, Mr. Cole, this reminds me of Jingle Bell! Yeah! Let's play some Jingle Bell! <laughs>
as a result to this being one of our newer schools, none of the students in these, in the videos you just saw were taking private lessons. However, the schools that have been with us for a longer period of time, such as CPE, CPE2, River East, many of those students take private lessons and are affiliated with our after school program. We actually encourage all of our students to take private lessons and become a part of our after school program because it gives our students a chance to further solidify everything they're learning in music. Majority of our after school students receive financial aid. With maximum aid, a students can receive lessons for as low as $5 per lesson. That's right, okay, $5 a lesson. That's almost unheard of. And almost everyone in our program is on financial aid. We offer, we have students from all over the city enrolled into our program. We offer ensemble classes as well as group and private lessons on the violin, viola, cello, piano, and guitar. Our after school program contains 94 students. In fact, one of our 14 year old students, Anna Isabella Espana will be featured on From the Top tonight. She'll be performing on From the Top tonight. Here is a video of her practicing and getting ready for the performance in a feature with From the Top. setup of the student because we feel that it will give the student the freedom that they need in order to really take their music career to the next level if they choose to and if they don't choose to that is fine as well but we want to make sure that we give them the best of the teaching and the foundation that they can achieve. Several of our students go on to perform and pursue music in college. Our recent graduates have gotten into Juilliard, Ithaca College, New England Conservatory, Boston Conservatory, a variety of colleges, Manus College. Last November, we held our 25th anniversary to Carnegie Hall's performance. Many of our alumni even flew back from where they lived. Some came from Florida, some came from even further to witness our current students perform. They also joined in for the final song. In addition, we had a special appearance with Mark O'Connor, who played Orange Blossom with the students on stage. Here's a live clip from that performance. And these are our current students, and each of these students take private lessons. And this happened not even about a year ago, but right before the pandemic happened.
campus is truly a magical place. I'm so honored and humbled to be a part of this program. Here are a few words from our students and Roberta on how they feel about our program and what our program represents. music if it weren't offered in my public schools and I just feel like that was a real gift and I think all kids should have it believe it or not now even now still they're cutting music out of everything my name is Emilia Smith I am nine years old I play two instruments it's the violin and the cello I like the cello because it's a low instrument and I like String instruments, which have four strings. Opus 118 gave us access to um, music lessons that we would not have considered if Opus was not at our school. Opus 118 has two primary programs. The in-school program, which offers group violin classes for students in first grade through fifth grade. We also have an after-school program which helps supplement the learning that happens in the in-school program. There are a lot of programs that only do private lessons or only go into the schools. Opus is one of the rare ones that creates a bridge and allows children to pursue their interest in music further than the group instruction that takes place during the day. I've been a part of Opus 118 for 15 years now. Violin, I think it keeps you away from trouble because it's something you, you know, you have to put time, effort, and, you know, work into it. Opus is a magical place. They have a way of teaching you music that is so effective and motivating. Our program focuses on building a solid foundation and there's a sense of a violin community and the kids inspire each other. Some people don't get to play music and I get to, I just feel proud. They learn to focus, they learn to listen, they learn to problem solve, they learn to memorize, they're learning a fantastic language so that they can have self-expression. Having a program in Harlem provides an opportunity to serve people who really need access. Kaufman Music Center has allowed Opus to stand up and be strong again, supporting us administratively and being a wonderful role model for us as a community music school we are adding more public schools to our program, and I hope one day we can serve most of East Harlem. I love Opus 118 because it makes me feel very proud. I learned a lot from Roberta. I've been observing her lately because, you know, I want to be a teacher. Opus 118 gave me an unforgettable journey. Opus 118 gave me music. Because of Opus, I was able to find my passion, performing and teaching. And because of Opus, I'm able to live my passion. It's hard enough to find your passion, but when you get to live your passion as well, it's truly a blessing. I'm a better teacher because I perform and I'm a better performer because I teach. They both go hand in hand. I truly feel honored to work at this nonprofit establishment. Thank you so much for inviting a part of Opus to be a part of this wonderful series. It is truly a pleasure to speak with you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. While you take a moment to think of questions, I also have a few images of me and my students in the classroom.
This is, these are my students in rest position. We first, our setup is very slow. So first we start them with the violin and then we introduce the bow and then we do a variety of games. And we, I try to make sure that everyone, they, they really understand where their fingers are supposed to go and where their violin is supposed to be placed. Because once they can truly understand where each of these items are and how they are placed on their body, then when they go home, they will feel more confident in their practice. Are there any questions I can answer regarding setup, regarding our program? Oh, hey, Nicole, this is this is Maddie talking. Um, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'm super inspired. I think this is really amazing. Um, you know, your students play so beautifully. And I'm especially inspired to hear how many students from the program go on to pursue music at the conservatory level. Um, I do have a question. I know that um, you mentioned that some of the students in the program um, come from families who might not have a lot of money. And I know that the college audition process can be extremely expensive. Uh, recordings, perspective lessons, flights uh, during non-COVID times, these things add up. Um, I'm wondering um, in what ways you or your fellow teachers in the program help these students navigate the college audition process. Um, and if you've, I don't know, if you've been in a situation where a student who really is talented and wants to pursue music um, might need a little bit of extra help in this situation. Um, I think that our director, Haley, would go to the proper resources in which she could help the parent further pay for their college experience. I, when it was with me and my students, fortunately, they were able to gather the money to, to pay for these auditions. But the board and our administration would be there actively with the parents to help them through the issue or through the situation to make sure that they're able to go on these auditions. And some of these auditions, they are waived. Um, some of the fees, if you, if you make below a certain amount of money, then the college application fee is waived. I know that works for some of the common application apps. Also, with recording and stuff, since we're partnered with the Kaufman Center, we're sometimes able to rent out the recording equipment and we're also able to schedule a room within their building to help our students go into the building and record for their auditions. I hope this was able to answer your question. And if oh yeah, that's, there, that's so I cool about the Kaufman Center too. I, I forgot about the partnership. <laughs> yeah, in 2012, we partnered with the Kaufman Center and they really help us financially and they help us since they're a previous organization, they're kind of on an umbrella for us and they kind of help nurture us and mentor us in ways that Opus couldn't because we, we help families that don't necessarily have a lot of money. So we're a nonprofit, we also don't have enough a lot of money. So having Kaufman there to really help us has been a true blessing. Hi, Nicole, it's Sasha speaking. Hi, Sasha. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing this. I'm so inspired by you and your students. Um, I, as you probably know, I teach a pretty similar population. Um, of students in New York City. <laughs> and I have to say, my students never look quite as organized as yours <laughs> in the classroom. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm so, I mean, I'm so happy for their energy and, and for them being there and their creativity. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of your process and setting up your students. And I think for anyone, even adults, just like setting up playing a string instrument can be quite a complicated, sometimes frustrating process. So can you maybe talk a little bit about your approach in setting up um, your young students to play so beautifully? Do you mean by setting up with an organization of the class or do you, mind set, do you mean setting up on how I teach them how to hold the bow and the violin? Um, I guess teaching them how to, I guess, like getting through the basic technique of like holding the bow and holding the instrument, um, which can be kind of like a long, long process um, of doing that and like how you keep the students engaged and like 
manage your classroom through that experience, beginning experience. Okay. So if I'm teaching a group class, I first begin when I give the students their instruments, I size them, I place them in size order. So everyone has assigned seats. As soon as they enter the classroom, I try to have as much structure as possible. So there isn't time for them to get distracted because when we're dealing with five-year-olds, they can get distracted in an instant. If they see a penny on the floor, that's it. You could have lost their attention. So what I try to do is make sure, of course, there's nothing on the floor. As soon as they enter the class, I size them in size order. When I have them in size order, that means everyone can be seen. And once I have them in size order and I place them in their assigned spots, their cases also have an assigned spot. So not when the cases should be right next to them and the cases are usually on their left side. When the cases are on their left side, the small part of the case is facing the back of, back of the room and everyone has their case the same way. That way no one is distracted. Also, I can see if there's one case out of order, it will be easy for me to just go straight to that person. If there's a little bit of chaos, then I won't know where my eyes are supposed to focus. If everyone is looking close to the same, then I can zoom in on who really needs help. And if I have a helper, I would either take the front line and my intern will take the back line. Once we set up with, we teach them how to take out the instrument. Once they learn how to take out the instrument, I teach them how to place the sponges on their instrument. In terms of bows, when they place their bow down on the floor, um, everyone has to place their bow the same direction. So for us, the tip will be at the window, the frog would be at the door. Everyone's bow is in order. And so when I say take your bow out, everybody knows to take their bow out. Sometimes I ask them to take the bow out on my clap. That way they're listening for my clap. They're able to they're able to respond to me and they're able to be engaged in a different way and it's stimulating their brain. Also, they're moving together as a unit. When we're playing in a concert, we always have to move together. So if I'm starting them to move together right away, right in the beginning of class, then we then they're already working on their rhythm. When they take out their bows, we, we do bow. I teach them the parts of the bow. Once I teach them the parts of the bow, we have different games to help them remember. Like we have the Simon Says game. And I say, Simon Says, point to the scroll on my clap or point to the tip on my clap. Everyone must point to the same thing with the same hand. If they don't point to the same thing with the same hand, we play a little game called um, who can be the last person standing. And this gets them really excited. Also, they get really kind of like, um, energized because they're playing a game and they're working together and they're a part of a team. So it, um, I'm already doing things that are team building and I'm also doing things that are having them work together as a unit and also focus on themselves with independence. So I guess what I am saying to wrap it up, because this could go on for a long time if I go into how I structure holding the violin, what, I, what I'm saying is I try to make sure to have everything in extreme order where I can see everyone, they're all in size order, everyone is moving together and everyone is knows the basis of where they need to be. So the cases have a, a sign spot, the student has a sign spot, their instruments have a sign spot. And when their violins are in rest position, that is also in an assigned spot. Their scrolls should be facing in front of them, their scrolls should be level. If they're in if they're in size order, that means their instrument should also be at the same level. No one's instrument should be lower because they're in size order. You're not, no one's taller than you don't have to raise up your instrument to, in order for you to be with the person next to you. Was that helpful? <laughs> that was super helpful. I know helpful. that was a lot of information at once. No, that was great. It was really great. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Sasha. So I have a question, Nicole, about um, the, ups and downs you must have experienced with uh, the with Opus 118 partnering with public schools, various administrations. Can you tell us a little bit about how you guys have weathered that? Administrations in what aspect? Do you mean with the teachers or do you mean with the principals? I mean with the or principals both. and the and yeah and the and the partnerships with have you ever encountered any resistance or I have um I've been very fortunate. I know there's some schools that have had a bit of um, resistance with their principal. The principals at both of my schools really, really enjoy the violin program and I'm very close with my principals so I can actually go to them for mentorship. I did, however, had a problem at River East and it was, it was in term of spacing. So it wasn't so much the principal 
people didn't want us to be there or they were upset that we were taking the students, but they ran out of space. So when they got all of this teaching equipment, such as desks and chairs and books, they ended up putting that in the violin room and thought that it would still be enough room for the kids to play. And what when I tell you there was not enough room, they just didn't understand how much room a student would need when they're playing. I I had 15 kids in a class and they left me with the room with maybe, you see one of those lines here, a green row. I had 50, 15 students and they left me that much space, a row of boxes. And they thought that that was enough. And I had to explain to them, that's not enough. And when they realized that not that wasn't enough, they're like, we don't know what to do. We don't want to not have the violin program, but we don't have any space for these boxes. And so they moved us into the auditorium. And that was, that was a bit tough, um, especially for the students, but we were able to manage it. I feel that the closer you are with your principal and the more accommodating you are, the more accommodating the principal is, especially when they see the work that you're doing with the students. If you see that, if they see that the students love what you're doing, if they see that the students are improving, if you're adding value to their school, they are more receptive to giving you what you need. Also, if you're not kind of um, badgering about everything you need, we also need to have some sort of, we need our own independence because the principal has so much to deal with. We are just a little part of what they have to deal with on their plate. So we need to work with them as well as sometimes let things slide. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Um, uh -huh. Hi, yeah. Um, just as a follow-up to Liz's question, that was really helpful information. Um, I'm a public school teacher in Western Massachusetts, and um, I'm just wondering if any of the schools that you're in um, have, like, general music teachers, and if so, could you speak a little bit about the relationship of your program to those teachers? Uh, we do not have a... One, our school did not... Both of the schools I work at did not have a general music teacher. They did have a chorus teacher, we were two separate entities and we did not merge. Um, though I think it would be a great idea one day to merge with a choir teacher and perhaps do a song with them, um, we have not. I just, I became the head teacher at River East two years ago. So this would have been the year that I would have tried to merge something because I think that's a great idea to just get the students playing and singing at the same time. But um, COVID happened. That was actually on my New Year's resolution. I wish I could show you it because you just said what was on my New Year's resolution. It was to have my students play for some singers and it would have been great if they could play with their friends. But unfortunately, I don't have any with the music teacher and neither do, do my colleagues. But if you wanted to, I totally support that. And I think there's so much you can do. For, for instance, the students can just play a tonic and sometimes it's only an open string. So they can hold a drone while the kids are singing and they will just feel so proud of themselves and so happy. So if you ever decide to send me the video, I would totally watch. <laughs> Anyone else I can help or share my experience? Could you tell us your, um, maybe one of your biggest challenges teaching in the program and also one of your favorite memories? My biggest challenge. I'll start with my favorite memory. Okay, you know what? Just because I want to end on a positive too, I'll start with my favorite memory, talk about a challenge because I still have to think of one, and then end with a positive memory as well. If there's oh. no challenges, that's okay. I was just curious. <laughs> I think I could think of something. I just need a moment. Um, but my favorite memory was when we had a violinist I went to my master's program with, Izima. Um, her name is Meredith Izima, and she came down to our school and she played for the kids and the kids were so excited. They started chanting her name when she came on stage and they were just yelling, Ezima, Ezima, with their instruments. And they were clapping and she played for them. And she played like a really fast song and she played songs that they knew. So they were just so in shock because they were like, wow, she's playing my favorite song. She knows my song. And then at the end, when the kids 
performed their Canon and D, she, Canon and D, she ended up coming on stage and performing Canon and D with them, and then sewing an improvisation on top of the Canon and D. The students are still talking about it to this day. They ask me how she's doing. They ask it when she's gonna come back. They follow her on Instagram. The parents also follow her on Instagram. She made a video about it with her videographer. I should have brought that today too. Um, but yeah, that was a, a highlight because the kids were so proud of themselves. Parents were crying. Um, the principal even came up to me and said it was one of our best concerts. So it was really nice because we had, we had a violinist come from outside of our program into our program and play with our students. And they were just so proud. A moment where I had difficulty um, a moment where I had difficulty. Would have been the boxes. It was really difficult with the boxes because we had to, we had, uh, how many students did we have, Rose? 40? I would say about that, yeah. 40 kids and every class we would have to go get the violins from the classroom and shuttle them to the auditorium. And the schools that we are in, they are not, it's not just one student or not just one school in the school. There are like three schools in the school. So if somebody makes a mistake and they somehow have to use the auditorium, then the music, the violin students have to leave. And sometimes we'll be, we would have to leave in the middle of a lesson and the students will be into what they're doing. And I express to you, they get distracted very quickly, very, very quickly. So when, once they have to leave, that's kind of like the end of my period, that it's done. And it's not that the kids don't want it, it's that there's a room situation. So that was a challenge. Um, yeah. I think that's, are there any more questions? You had so much momentum with this amazing um, start that Opus 118 got and the and it has this distinguished history and it's so famous now. Do you think there is a chance for um, young programs that want to do something like this in today's climate? I think we need it. I think they should totally try. I think without trying, we'll never know. And I think there's always room for growth. and. Opus 118 is only in Harlem, but there's so many kids that need music. It's not just about Harlem, it's about the world. Like, even if they don't become musicians when they grow up, music teaches them self-confidence. Music makes them proud of themselves. If I didn't have music, I really don't know where would I have, where I would have been. And if somebody decided like, oh, there's already an Opus, I can't do this, then I would have been out of, out maybe, playing the violin, I, where would I be? I don't know, we, we, we saw on the video where I came from. I didn't come from big beginnings. I came from very, very humble. I came from pretty much nothing. So if somebody didn't try, if Roberta didn't try, what, what would so many lives be like? The point is not to be opus. The point is, the point is just to share music and give people the opportunity to have music. Uh, yeah. Are there any more questions? Thank you so much, Nicole. This has been great. Um, Thank you for taking for the time. Me. This was truly a dream. I'm, whenever I can talk about Opus, I can't stop. It's just, it has truly saved my life and I know so many others. I. I don't know how to stop the share, guys. Just so I you know. Oh, I do, I do. I'm just kidding.